gospel writer Luke says this, that after they had crucified him, Jesus simply said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do me a favor, nudge somebody and tell them it ain't that easy. These words first uttered on the lips of Jesus while dying on Calvary's cross, Bishop Bloomer are the most debated among scholars about their authenticity. Scholars debate whether or not Jesus actually said these words. The debate stems simply from the fact that in some of their earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of Luke, these first words are strangely missing. There are some copies of the Gospel of Luke that record Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, and there are many others that do not. Upon further research, scholars have realized that the omission of these words are not because Jesus did not utter them, but rather because in the early stages of the growth of the church, the early church decided to delete them because of the growing tension between Christians and Jews. And the early Christian church was still bitter and broken about the death of Jesus Christ and wanted the Jews to be held accountable for their role in nailing Jesus to the cross. When the temple was therefore destroyed in 70 AD, the Christian church looked at it as a sign that God had not forgiven the Jews for their role in crucifying their Lord and Savior. And therefore, some early church leaders decided to take erasers to their pens and delete these words that Jesus utters from the cross. The debate comes from the deletion, but the deletion stems from the difficulty of realizing how challenging it is to live up to these words that Jesus utters from the cross. Early church leaders understood what church folks still know today, that sometimes it ain't that easy to let folk off the hook. You ain't got to say, man, I know I just slid down your driveway because somebody can say, Pastor, I've heard a lot of sermons on forgiveness. I know I'm supposed to let it go. I know I'm supposed to sweep it under the rug. Uh, but you don't know my ex-husband. You, you just don't know what he did to me. You don't know what she said to me. You don't know how ugly it got. You don't know how much they hurt me. You don't know how much they lied on me. You don't know the dirt they did to me. And when I sit back even now, it went down in 76, but I feel like it happened yesterday. I can remember. Remember everything they did, every pain, every ounce of hurt, every bitterness. Is there anybody here that's ever had some folk do you wrong? And as much as you love the Lord, as big as your Bible is, as many scriptures as you can quote, as many hymns as you can sing, as often as you've been in church, if the truth be told, there's something some Negroes have done to you that's just hard to let go. It ain't that easy to let them off the hook. I come by to tell you tonight, that offense is inevitable. You just keep living long enough, you're going to find out that every day Satan anoints and assigns somebody to offend you. Every day somebody wakes up to burden you with bitterness and blind you from the blessings. I, I, I can't preach to the folk that ain't real. I need some folk that know that if you keep on living, somebody going to get on your last nerve. If, if you keep on living, somebody's going to lie on you and they don't even know you from Adam. If you keep on living, somebody's going to throw you under the bus. If you keep on living, somebody's going to say something at the side of their neck and you're going to want to slap them on general principle because people are assigned. to burden you with bitterness. If you know it's difficult to forgive folk, and the next time you get there, I want you to hang out at the cross and hear what Jesus utters with the first words out of his lips. You must understand that in order to speak Dr. Charles while being crucified required even more agony. One had to lift oneself up on the nails and breathe in with a beaten and battered back and expand the diaphragm to pull in air in order to utter work. This was not easy for Jesus to say. But the point of the matter is Jesus wants you to know no matter how bad it has hurt you, no matter how deeply it cut you, no matter how much you've been wounded, the minute you have been offended, forgiveness has to be your goal. I know you didn't come to hear that. You want me to shout you on something else. But when Satan has allowed somebody to offend you and you are carrying around the bitterness, the very first thing Christ teaches us is that you've got to reach a point where you realize I have to.
to forgive them. And so here's a Jesus who has told us to forgive. And now he's going to teach us to forgive. Notice how Jesus teaches us to forgive. He cries out, Father, forgive them. And I need to let you pause. This bothers me, Dr. Bryant, because Jesus has told us we got to forgive folk. He told the disciples 70 times seven. And then he gave a quid pro quo in the Lord's prayer and said, if you don't forgive others, God can't forgive you. Even Jesus has looked at others who have sinned against God and said, your sins be forgiven thee. But when he's dying on the cross and it has happened to him, he does not say, I forgive you. He says, Father, forgive them. I'm not ready to talk to y'all just yet. I, I can't deal with the folk that put me up here right now. So before I say anything to you, I need you to know that I need to talk to God because this is something that I need God to do. Can I just tell you that that's where true forgiveness begins? Not when you throw yourself in front of the Negroes that did you wrong, but when you can look at them eyeball to eyeball and tell them, I'm not ready to talk to you yet, but I'm praying about it. I haven't let it go yet, but I'm praying about it. I'm not trying to get hooked up with you again, but I'm praying about it. And if you just give me a moment to pray and get right with God and put it in the hands of God, then I'll be able to deal with you. I come by to tell you that sometimes this thing is so hard that you need God to help you do it. My, my oldest son had some homework the other day, a large homework assignment, and I sent him upstairs to do his homework. After a little while, I went to check on him, went upstairs, and he was playing on the Xbox. I looked at him and said, son, you got homework to do. Why are you playing on Xbox? He said, Daddy, the homework was too hard, so I gave up and got on the Xbox. I said, son, when it's too hard, you don't give up. You call on your daddy to come help you. And when folk have done you that wrong, and it's hard to let it go, and hard to forgive them, and hard to let them off the hook, God says, don't give up. You call on me, and I will be able to help you do what I've called you to do to forgive. How can I push this thing? He says, Father, forgive them. Th that word forgive literally means hold back some things. Lord, I, I know there's some things that ought to be happening, but hold it back. N now, now, see, the reason you don't shout because you don't remember what Jesus could be praying. Go back to the Garden of Gethsemane when they arrest Jesus and Peter cuts off Malchus' ear. And Jesus looks at Peter and said, Peter, you ain't got to do that. No, 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 you ain't got to cut him. Because if I wanted to, I could pray to God right now. And I got 12 legions of angels on standby that are ready to descend and wipe this thing out. And when Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, this is in essence what he's saying. You ought to be glad. Because there's some other things I could release on you right now. There's some destruction I could bring your way right now. Uh, and that's what you ought to let some folk know when they've done you so wrong in life. You got to let them know, listen, I may not be ready to let you go right now. But you ought to thank God that I didn't do what I could have done in response to your offense. I need to preach to somebody tonight that knows you better be glad I didn't call my cousins. You better be glad I didn't send that email. You better be glad I didn't drive by your crib and bust out your windows. Because what you did to me, I could have done something else. He says, he says, hold it back. And the reason I've got to pray that for you is because that's what Jesus prayed for me. That, that, that you're not the only guilty offender in the room. I've done some wrong. 
And if the Lord didn't hold some stuff back from me, I wouldn't be here to... I need some real saints who can acknowledge that when you look at the dirt you've done, the wrong you did, the evil you crept up in, you ought to be glad that God held some stuff back. Say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeah, they did. No, don't come telling me you didn't. You, you knew good and daggone well what you was doing. Why does Jesus say they don't know what they're doing? It is not because he's sweeping it under the rug. It's not because he's just letting it go at the drop of a dime. But Jesus understands that their greatest crime was ignorance. Not of their actions but ignorance of the one they were doing it to. They didn't know that I was the savior. They didn't know that I was the one that would usher them into eternity. They didn't know that I was the one that would die, that they might live abundantly. They don't know who I am. I've got to leave you, but I come by to tell you that in the root of every bitter heart of a saint that won't forgive is someone who really doesn't understand who they are. Because when you really know who you are and know the gift that you are and know the blessings that you have and know how good God's been to you and know how the Lord has blessed your life, when folk do you wrong, you don't get mad at them. You feel sad for them because you really don't know who you just missed. You don't know the blessing that just walked out of your life. You don't know what God just snatched away from you by what you did to me. Goodbye, saints. May the Lord bless you real good. But here's your homework assignment. The next time somebody does you wrong, don't get mad. Go down to the drugstore. Find the hallmark section. That's where the cards are. Find the bereavement section. That's where the death cards are. Find a card that on the front says, sorry for your loss. And send it to everybody that did you wrong. Everybody that broke your heart. Everybody that spoke against you. I'm sorry for your loss. chapter, if you will indulge me uh, to read at the 39th verse is where I shall begin. Luke 23, I will begin at the 39th verse. And I'm going to read a familiar translation, amen. I know Bethany is high church, amen. So uh, I don't have the King James right now, but the new King James, is that okay? Amen. The New King James, it begins at the 39th verse. It says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Indulge me a little bit further. I just want to read the message translation. We don't hear that too often. I, I like the way it reads. It says, one of the criminals hanging alongside cursed him or cussed him some messiah you are save yourself save us but the other one made him shut up
have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Jesus said, don't worry. I will. Today you will join me in paradise. You may have your seats. But the other one made him shut up. Mm. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. He said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Jesus said, don't worry. I will. Today you'll join me in paradise. Very quickly, I want to speak to you, my new friends, from the subject, get real or get left. Get real or get left. Dr. Lacey, it's approximately five years ago that I went through withdrawal symptoms because I did not have my television. Most folk could not understand how in this day and age I could go without TV, but I was in a period of sacrifice and needed to make sure that some things were happening in my life and in the life of my ministry. So I decided to go without television. I, I don't mean just cable, but I mean television. I, I, I went without TV, and, but when the Lord re-blessed me with the gift of electronic images and sounds transmitted through a screen encased in a frame plugged into my wall, I went bananas. I, I went berserk. And, and I suppose those that might know me realize that every Thursday I go berserk. I go berserk. I, I turn into an entirely different person on Thursday nights. Uh, uh, I, I turn into an entirely different person because on Thursday nights I've got a date with ABC. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and I, I have a date with ABC and, and my girl Olivia Polk is fixing stuff uh, on Thursday nights. Uh huh. Y'all know Olivia the fixer. Some of y'all done knocked her down a peg or two. Huh? for Professor Annalise Keating, but, but I can't stay up late for Viola. I love Viola, but I, I can't stay up late for her. But, but it doesn't even matter because this year I've had to adjust my energy for the week. And although I love Olivia and I love Annalise and I got their back, we cool like that ain't nobody like my girl Cookie. represents everything that, that good and sophisticated folk want to ignore. Uh, I, I've read posts on Facebook uh, where people are calling Cookie and her family misrepresentations uh, uh, of the black race. I, I've read people who, who have said that Cookie and her family are representations of coonery and jiggery. I, I've seen on Twitter that some folks say that Cookie and Lucius represent everything that is wrong with black America. But I like Cookie. Why? Because Cookie is a survivor. Cookie made her mistakes and, and Cookie did her time. Not, not only did she make mistakes and do her time, but she did her time while her man went free. Cookie sat in jail and never forgot who she was, where she came from, and what it was that came from her womb. And, and even though Cookie may be a bit rough around the edges, uh, Cookie may not be a debutante queen, Cookie may not always conjugate her verbs, she, she may not have graduated from Spelman, uh, but I like Cookie because Cookie is a get real or get left kind of gal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cookie keeps it real while making sure that she survives what she needs to survive. And what we've got here, my brothers and sisters, in our text, we've got a survivor. We've got a survivor who's hanging on a cross. We've got a survivor who's hanging on a cross, and, and he's keeping it real so he won't get left. Uh -huh. Oh, I know what it looks like from ground level. Uh, it looks like all three of these men are knocking at death's door uh, from ground level, it looks like that they're all down for the count uh, while they're upright in execution.
execution mode. Uh, from ground level, it looks like it's all over. From ground level, it looks like they're done. It looks like they're over. Dust done. Finito. It looks like everything is finished. But that's what happens when you're looking at situations from the ground level. Uh, but I dare somebody on today uh, to adjust your vision. Uh, you'll see that one of these men, although in death mode, uh, is really a survivor. Uh, I'm not talking about Jesus, but I'm talking about this man, a man next to Jesus. Uh, we know about Jesus. Uh, most of us know the story about Jesus. Uh, but this dude, the one who's next to Jesus, uh, I like him. I like him. Uh, I like him because he's a survivor. Uh, but he is even in his own pain, even in his own agony. Uh, I can imagine even in his own regrets, uh, he is a get real uh, or get left kind of dude. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What do I mean? What do I mean? The Bible says uh, that there are three men hanging on a cross, uh, and one of them is Jesus, who's in the middle, according to the Gospel of John. Uh, the Bible says that one of the men, uh, one of these criminals, for no real reason, uh, begins to curse our Lord. Uh, Jesus is hanging on a cross, uh, just like him, but, but this criminal had heard some things about Jesus. Uh, this criminal had heard heard some things about his abilities uh, and he begins to curse Jesus uh, and then after cursing Jesus he demands to be saved uh, not only was he a criminal uh, but he wasn't too smart either uh, because he curses Jesus first uh, and then demands to be saved uh, now most folk amen would ask for a solid uh, they would ask for a solid first uh, and then if you did not come through then you might get cursed out yeah, yeah, but this man tells us uh, that he curses Jesus uh, and then ridicules him. Uh, and upon hearing the foolishness of this first criminal, uh, the Bible tells us that the second man, uh, this other criminal on death hill, uh, literally shuts down the first dude. Uh, that's what the Bible says. It says he shuts him down uh, and says, have you no fear of God? Uh, my brothers and sisters, I come to Brooklyn to tell you uh, that we need need more people with a shut down attitude. I like this man. I, I like him because he's dying on a cross. He's hanging on an implement of execution. And just like Jesus, he's likely been spat upon. He's been ridiculed like Jesus. He's been flogged as well. But he gathers up whatever dignity is left and he raises up a shut down attitude. And some of us here today need to gather up some dignity uh, and raise up a shut down attitude. Uh, we need to shut down some stuff in our communities. Uh, we need to shut down some stuff in our country. Uh, we need a shut down attitude. Uh, we need to choose the side of a righteousness. Uh, come on, y'all. We need a, a shut down attitude. Uh, we need a shut down attitude uh, that will turn people into revolutionists uh, and not sideline pacifists. Uh, we need a shut down attitude. We need a shut down attitude because everything that masquerades as being right is always not right. We need to look through the lens of Christ so you can shut it down for what it really is. We need a shut down attitude. We need a shut down attitude that will empower our people to go into the streets and fight war on poverty, fight gang violence. We need a shut down attitude. We need a shut down attitude uh, that will fight the good fight. Uh, so when the NYPD uh, is known for persecuting our people uh, rather than policing our populace, uh, we need uh, a shut down attitude. Uh, we need folks with attitudes uh, who will speak life into people uh, who know nothing but despair. Uh, God is looking for people uh, with a shut down attitude uh, because if we're going to be like Christ, uh, their job is not just to hang around. Uh, their job is not just to cuss and complain, but we need people who will hate the initiative and turn this world upside down with a shut down attitude. We're almost done. We're, we're almost done. The second criminal has to get real with the situation. 
This, this second criminal shuts down the first criminal because he recognizes that this is a do or die situation. Do or die, do or die. He, he's hanging on a cross, dying. But still, somehow, he possesses the optimism of a survivor. Are there any survivors here today? Uh, I, I don't care what your situation looks like. Looks, looks like you're dying in despair, but, but, but really you're a survivor. Yeah, yeah, it's a surviving situation. It's make it or break it for some of us. It's, it's now or never because God has placed you in a position. It's a position that might be uncomfortable. It's a position that you might not be used to, but you realize that you are in that position so you can get to the next level. Somehow you know it's time to get real or get left. So this remorseful criminal uh, shuts down the crazy dude uh, who misses out because of his poor communication skills, uh, shuts him down and says to Jesus, uh, he says, Jesus, mm, uh, I need you to remember me uh, when you enter into your kingdom. Uh, now that's real right there. Uh, that's wisdom right there. Uh, word up. He says, remember me uh, when you enter into your kingdom. He says, remember me. Re remember. That's wisdom right there. Lord, uh, I, I just need you to remember me. Uh, uh, if nothing else happens, God, I, I just need you to remember me. Uh, not what I've done, but, but remember me, Lord God. Uh, I, I'm the one who hung on a cross uh -huh, at the crux of life's crucible. Uh, I, I'm the one that from ground level four were laughing at me. Uh, but Lord, I need you to remember me. Uh, I'm the one, Lord God, from ground level of folks were placing bets against my life. Uh, but Jesus, uh, I need you to remember me. Uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, God is looking for men and women uh, who will get real with their situation. Uh, get real or get left. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I don't plan on getting left. Uh, I need to get real uh, because I need for Jesus uh, to say to me, don't worry. Uh, I will remember you. And I won't remember tomorrow, but I'll start right now today. Oh, folk might think you're headed for death, but you're going to survive because you'll be with me, the living God. Is there anybody here on today who's got a get real or get left attitude? I don't care what they're saying about you. I don't care what talk they talk. I don't care what bets they're making. But is there anybody here on today? Let's go.
attention. Chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, and it reads, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. I want to talk about provision in the midst of pain. Provision in the midst of pain. Beloved, I believe many of us have discovered that life offers many opportunities to experience great heights of joy. And it likewise offers many opportunities to experience great depths of pain. From the joy of that first step to the pain of that first fall, someone knows you haven't really lived until you've both laughed and cried. For while pain is unwelcome, unpleasant, uncomfortable, it is also unavoidable. Which is why if we could develop the faith produced by painful experiences without actually going through those experiences, we most certainly would avoid them at any cost. If we could learn the lessons taught by painful experiences without actually having to live out those experiences, we would most certainly avoid them at any cost. If we could gain the invaluable insights gathered from life's painful experiences without actually having to experience those experiences, I believe we would most certainly avoid them at every cost. But the reality is it's, it's those experiences that take us through the most hell that end up ushering us to the highest heights. Scottish historian and essayist Thomas Carlyle observed that adversity is the diamond dust with which heaven polishes its jewels. Someone's testimony tonight is that it was adversity that made you who you are. You would have never known how strong you are had it not been for adversity. You would have never discovered how resilient you are had it not been for adversity. Someone knows you would not be as stable as you are today had it not been for adversity, had life not knocked you down, had you never had to hold your head up in spite of, had sorrow not sucked the breath out of you, had you not been forced to survive in spite of a storm. It was a painful experience which made David declare, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? It was a painful experience that made Joseph say, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for my good. It was a painful experience that made Job declare, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It was a painful experience that made Paul declare, all things work together for our good. And someone in this house knows that when you look back over your life, you know that the reason you made it through what you've been through is God. It was God who took care of you when no one else could. It was God who did for you what no one else would. It was God who consoled you when you could not be consoled. It was God who made a way for you when there was no way to be made. Who picked you up when life knocked you down? It was nobody but God. Who took care of you when you were broken, battered, bleeding, and bruised? It was nobody but God. Who kept you in your trials, covered you in the rain, wiped away your tears, and brought you through your pain? Somebody holler, nobody but God. And if you have yet to be introduced to the adverse part of life called pain, tap somebody, tell them, just keep on living. Just keep on living. Because the truth is, you're either on your way into such an experience, coming out of a painful experience, or you're in the midst of a painful experience right now. Beloved, this is exactly where we find Mary and John as they stand at the foot of the cross tonight in the midst of one of the most painful experiences they've ever had in life with no idea how they're going to make it to the other side. How do you get up tomorrow after what you've had to go through today? 
How will you face life tomorrow after everything you've had to experience today? How will you go on tomorrow when life as you know it will now never be the same? Understand, beloved? Jesus, in the midst of his own painful experience, helps his mother and this disciple whom he loves get through their pain. Watch this. First of all, by forcing them to accept the aftermath. See, in order to survive a painful experience, you must acknowledge that there will be an after to your experience. Tell your neighbor, I know it looks bad right now. I know it's a hard pull right now, but trouble really does not last always. Tell them there will be an after to all of this. I declare into your life right now that your after will be better, that your after will be brighter, and in your after, you will be bigger. In your after, you will be wiser. In your after, you will be stronger. In your after, you will be better. Jesus looks down upon his mother and his friend in this third utterance, beloved, and forces them to look beyond their present pain into the aftermath of this painful experience. And I'm talking to somebody tonight who needs to stop stressing over the strain and pain of your current situation and start focusing on setting up your future. So what? You lost the job. Get out there and go get you a better one. So so what? The car broke down. Get out there and get you a better one. So what? That brother, that sister walked out of your life. Go out there and get you a better one. You must maximize a painful moment by using it to prepare for your next move. Tell your neighbor, this moment is not the end of me, but I do have another move. Jesus says, woman, here is your son. Disciple, here is your mother. Because if you're going to survive a painful experience, you must not only acknowledge that there will be an aftermath, but understand, beloved, you must accept a new level of accountability. I wish I had somebody right here who understands there is a purpose to your pain. Pain will push you into your purpose. Understand that pain will place you on the path to your destiny. Pain will reposition you for a new realm of responsibility. And I can't get a witness right here, but somebody knows you wouldn't be where you are today if pain had not pushed you there. If that teacher had never told you you'd never be anything, you would have never gone through school. If that job hadn't let you you go you would have never started your own business if you had never gone through some of the things you've been through you would have never found your purpose you would have never embraced God's mandate for your life you would have never said yes to the calling of God you would have never come into agreement with God about where he's taking you and what he's doing in your life David said it was good that I was afflicted it was good that I had to go through this it was good that I had to experience this because it's this experience that ushered me into my destiny. He says, woman, here's your son to the disciple. Here's your mother. Because if you're going to survive a painful experience, you not only have to acknowledge that there will be an aftermath and accept a higher level of accountability. But understand, beloved, uh, you must understand that you are the answer to someone's problem. I wonder, am I talking to anybody who's ever found your own healing by helping someone else? Have you ever found the balm for your own wound by being a blessing to someone else? I believe I'm talking to somebody right here who understands that you aren't just going through what you're going through for you, but you're going through so that you can help somebody else. For what's the point of having wounds if you aren't going to show them to anybody? What's the point in having a testimony if you're not going to tell it to anybody? What's the point in going through hell if you're not going to go back and help anybody? Beloved, I came to tell you, you're not just going to come through this, but I declare.
declare tonight that you're coming out with company. You can't give up now because you are the answer to somebody's problem. You can't give up now because you are the comfort for somebody's crisis. You are the one God is going to use to save somebody from committing suicide. You are the one God is going to use to snatch somebody from the grips of self-destruction. You are God's provision for somebody else's pain. Woman, here is your son. Disciple, here is your mother. And I wish you would slap your neighbor right about now and tell him you sat in the right seat tonight because my first name is problem and my last name is solver because I'm anointed to be a blessing. I am appointed to be a blessing. My assignment is to be a blessing. And if I can help somebody as I travel on, if I can help somebody with a word or a song, if I can help somebody as I travel on, then my living, I said my living, it shall not, somebody say it will not, it cannot be in vain. Somebody slap high five your own self right here and declare, I am the solution to somebody's problem. I am the provision for somebody else's pain. Won't he use your church? Won't he use your church? Won't he make you a blessing? To be a blessing, somebody shout glory. Somebody shout it, yeah. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. Verse 46. Says, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabbathan. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For just a few minutes, I want to talk about this is too much. There are several words from the cross that cause me consternation. The first word where Jesus has the nerve to ask, God to forgive this crowd messes with me the fifth word where they give him vinegar to constrict his throat instead of loose his throat messes with me but I don't think any word messes with me from the cross like the one I posit for our consideration this evening because here in this cry of dereliction Jesus is feeling abandoned by the very one that sent him. As a matter of fact, what Jesus calls him in that moment gives us a peek into his psyche. Eloi is a Hebrew derivative of the Hebrew word Elohim. If you understand Jewish and Old Testament theology, they only used the word God or Elohim when they were describing the delivering nature of Yahweh. So he calls him deliverer in the same breath he calls him abandoner. It's a struggle for Jesus because what Jesus is suggesting by calling him God and by saying you left me is that your actions seem to be contradicting your nature <laughs> that what i'm going through doesn't match who i know you to be i've called you jehovah jireh but my bills aren't paid i've called you jehovah rofa but i'm still taking medicine I called you Jehovah Shalom, but I still can't get a good night's sleep. Jesus suggests to us that there are moments in your life 
where your context will contradict the very nature of who you know God to be. And at this moment, Jesus feels more alone than he has ever felt. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm struggling with this word because he has done this thing for God. And doing his assignment has not only caused him pain and suffering, but now he feels like the one who sent him on the assignment has left him by himself to deal with the worst part of the assignment. If I can really be honest, I just want to argue for you a few minutes. He's not just mad with God, he's mad with himself. Because this was not an assignment he was demanded to do. This was an assignment he decided to do. And something he chose to do is giving him difficulty in his own decision. And at that moment, he begins to look at what he decided to do. And the hell he's catching because he made a decision. And the God that is a deliverer that has left him. And he says, this is too much. And I must admit, because I don't have much time, I'm glad that Jesus had this moment. Because in a real sense, it helps me and you and everybody watching on the Word Network to know that your anointing does not dismantle your humanity. I think I just said something that that I don't care how anointed you are I don't care how saved you are life can bring a twist that will give you a human moment I'm not talking to everybody just three people in your section have you ever been there you do all you're supposed to do you follow God's plan with obedience and your obedience has led to such pain and agony that you feel like God has left you to navigate through the darkest moments by yourself you feel disconnected from the one you need to be connected to in order to get through how many of y'all tonight can say I'm saved I'm sanctified I'm filled with the Holy Ghost I speak in tongues but life can bring me some situations where I have a human moment I wish I had some real folk suffering will put you in touch with your humanity y'all don't want to talk to me in here tonight in a real sense in the historical context this crucifixion is the result of a domination political system that gives an unjust murder and how many y'all know that much of what we see today they want to call us thugs and they want to say we're out of control but what they don't understand is that injustice will give you a human moment that's why y'all shut down Camden Yards because injustice will give you a human moment uh, y'all ain't talking to me Trayvon dying and Zimmerman getting free will give you a human moment uh, Freddie Gray dying and a mistrial will give you a human moment is there anybody tonight that knows life will give you a human moment so now I ain't got but six minutes um he's struggling in this moment Bishop Bloomer, because of the darkness. In a theological sense, we know that the darkness is the sign that the weight of the sin of the world is on his shoulders. But walk with me for a few minutes if you can let me do a parabolic exegesis of this moment. Um, it's dark. And Jesus is feeling forsaken. Abandoned. Left by himself which means there will be moments where you have to do ministry even when you don't feel God come here y'all ain't trying to talk to me gods can seem conspicuously silent and strangely absent and sometimes you will be forced to work for God when you ain't hearing nothing from God I'm about to get in trouble so much for the modern day prophet that gets a word of revelation every day from God so much for the modern day preacher that's got a periscope every hour about some deep word there are moments in your life where God ain't talking to you there are moments when you pray and God don't tell you your breakthrough is coming in six days your seed ain't gonna give you nothing he is silent 
sometimes you can call on him and get nothing back in response but let me help somebody tonight his seeming absence is never an excuse to abort the assignment on your life i'm finna come get you sometimes you got to sing and you don't feel him you got to preach and you don't feel him you got to usher and you don't feel him you got to worship and you don't feel him there will be some days where you got to do ministry where you feel like god is not there and I know why about 35% of y'all ain't shouting because some of us can only praise him when he does something for you. Some of us can only shout when you feel something. But I'm looking for a thousand of y'all and a million of y'all on the Word Network who can say I'm in a situation where I ain't feeling God. But with my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise with a heart of thanksgiving shake your neighbor's hand and tell him i don't feel him but i gotta praise i don't see him but i gotta praise he ain't said nothing to me but i'm saying something to him and can i tell you tonight the praise that scares the devil ain't your church sanctified praise but the praise that scares the devil is a praise when you're in the darkness because he thinks he's the prince and you got the nerve to be shouting on territory he thinks belongs somebody in the dark go and shout real quick and show the devil you can shout even in the Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then. And the text. The text tells us how you do it. Because what he quotes is a scripture. You missed it right there. It was too easy. He, he doesn't just speak some emotion. He goes to something his mama taught him. When he was a little Jewish boy the 22nd song see when you're in the middle of the darkness sometimes your seed ain't gonna work but if you got a word in your mouth come on, i'm looking for the word for real quick that's why i love what he says on that cross we miss this thing he doesn't just say god why did you forsake me he said my god and sometimes you just got to remind yourself i'm broke but he's still my god i'm unemployed but he's still my job I can't find a job, but he's still my God. My house is in foreclosure, but he's still my God. Go find three people and tell them no matter what you're going through, don't you ever forget, he's still. Hold on. Hold on. Then it hit me. It hit me. God doesn't always answer prayers by what he says. Sometimes he answers prayers by what he does. Y'all didn't get it. He answers the prayer of Jesus, not by giving him a word, but by giving him endurance. And how many of y'all know the fact that you still here is all the hell is God's answer to your situation. Shake your neighbor's hand like you're going to shake them to the harbor and tell them God answered my prayer because I should have been dead. I should have been crazy. I should have been in the corner. But the fact that I'm still here. Hold on. I got 45 seconds. Um. Here's the other thing. Here's the other thing messed me up. This is the middle of the day. And darkness comes. Jesus. Darkness is assigned tonight. But sometimes when you're walking in purpose, 
darkness has a way of hitting your life at the wrong time y'all y'all ain't trying to help me but here it is while it's the wrong time to you it's the right time to god because the darkness had to come no matter how painful it was because the darkness was the symbolism of judgment in biblical terminology and at that moment god was judging our sins and rome's system which meant it was the wrong time of day but it was the right time in providence because jesus had to be forsaken so that i could be forgiven and i just want three of y'all tonight who can say i ain't shouting over my money i ain't shouting over my job i ain't shouting over my car i'm shouting because i am forgiven go to three people tell them i am i'm done i'm done he quotes Y'all hang there, I'm coming in five minutes. Um, he quotes Psalm 22. Um, but here's what we miss. Psalm 22 is what's on his mind. Which means, Bloomer, it ain't just that one verse that's on his mind. It's the whole song. So you gotta know the whole song. To really know the mindset Jesus is in. That psalm starts off one way, Jesus, but it ends another way. It starts off with victimization, but it ends in validation. Even in the dark. Okay, y'all didn't get let me come get you. Um, some of y'all know I was an opera major in college. I was an opera major, I was an opera major, I was a music major. And I remember my freshman year. A group of friends of mine who had a humanities class had to do a report and so they were going to do a report on the opera that I was in La Boheme and so they came to La Boheme and uh, at the end of the night I called them and said man how'd y'all enjoy it they was like man we couldn't do the report and I said why couldn't y'all do the report they said cuz y'all were doing all that singing and everything was going good and then the lights went out and the curtain came down and we got up and left because we thought that was the end of the show. I had to explain to them, Jesus, that when the shifting of the axe come, they have to darken the stage and put down the curtain so the folk in charge can shift the stage. I came to make an announcement. The darkness you are in is not the end of your story. God's just shifted your atmosphere. Go and high five your neighbor and tell him it's shifting season. He's shifting my life. Shifting my family. He's shifting my finances. Would you do me one quick favor? Would you take your neighbor by the hand and tell your neighbor, neighbor, oh, neighbor, it's shifting time. That was the wrong neighbor. Turn on the other side. Take your neighbor by the hand. Shake him and rock him. Rock him and shake him. Shake him and rock him. And tell him, neighbor. your life he's shifting your family he's shifting your marriage he's shifting your job won't he do it i'm done won't he do it won't he do it won't he fight your battles won't he make your enemies your footstool won't he give you joy and sorrow won't he give you hope for tomorrow won't he dry your tears won't he won't he won't he won't he won't he and because I know my story isn't over, I'm a shout in the dark. Because I know he's not done with me, I can say weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And because he has not forgotten you he has not left you your story is not over and find three people and tell them 
you're coming out before it's all over. He's bringing you out. Say it. Yeah. Yeah. And ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Grab somebody tell him, I'm coming out. I'm coming out. I'm walking my way out. I'm dancing my way out. I'm shouting my way out. I'm running my way out. I'm coming. Now go on and get your dance like you coming out of the darkness. Like for you to look at John the 19th chapter, verse 28, John 19 and 28, as we continue in these seven last words, the fifth word, you'll find these words. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. I want to stop right there. Won't you help me put a tag on this text? Just look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, neighbor. I, won't I won't quit. That's what I want to talk about. I want to talk to somebody from the subject, I won't quit. I won't quit. You know, I don't know what it was about my father and his generation, but one of the worst things you could be, according to my father, was a quitter. I mean, I mean, my father, I don't know what it was. It was, almost, it was almost fanatical around this issue of quitting. In fact, one time, uh, I had a job. I had a job. I guess I was around, I was around 15, and I worked at a Woolworths. Y'all remember Woolworths? And I worked, I was, you know, all we could do is, I was a stock boy, kind of take care of the fish in the sections, you know, do all that kind of stuff. And I decided, I got it in my crawl that I didn't like the job. And I got it, you know, you're about 15, you're beginning to have a little piece of social life. And I'm sort of trying to balance between work and, you know, playing sports, having a little social life. I got it in my head, I don't like the job. I think my manager doesn't like me, you know, I'm, I'm fixing the scenario, I'm thinking I'm going to quit. I know enough about jobs, you know, stuff, you don't want to get fired, you want to quit. You know, that makes sense. So I decide I'm going to quit. And um, so I didn't quit, I, but I told my parents I was going to quit because I was kind of trying to get permission, fill them out. So I made it sound like, you know, I quit, see what they would say. Because if they were cool with it, then I was going to quit the next day. <laughs> so I made it sound like I quit, and my father blew a gasket. He blew a, I mean, scared me so much I was glad it wasn't true. <laughs> you know, so I made it, so, so I had to, in order not to sound like I was lying, I just had to make it, well, I, I can get it back, I can get it back, you know. But then in my arguing for a little while, I was like, but I might get fired and I'd rather, no, you do not quit. I mean, my father looked at me, he do not 
quit. I went back and didn't quit. I stayed, when, and sure enough, one more week came by. I got fired. <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, now, Dad, what you gonna do, you know? I'm thinking I'm messing up my career. Don't nobody know about Woolworths or that job at this point. But then he wanted to sit down. Now, after being fired, he wanted to sit down with me and talk about my work ethic. I wanted to talk, okay, so what'd you learn from this? Being fired is not the worst thing in the world. You're going to learn. What did you learn from this, Alan? And he wanted to talk about my, my work ethic. He wanted to talk about what I was doing. But he was very crystal clear, you do not quit. You may not go back. You know, sometimes some of us will join something and then, or let our children join, and the child comes home talking about, I don't want to do it anymore. And then we will fold and let them stop. Well, well my parents, they were like, you don't have to do it again, but you're going to finish this commitment. So you, you joined this year. You, you joined this year. You, you play in the oboe this year. You may not like the oboe next year, and you don't have to play it again next year, but you're going to finish this year. Or you, you know, you play, you play on the team and then you find out you ride in the bench and you want to quit the team. Oh no, you're going to ride the bench this year and I'm not going up there and fighting the coach for you. Oh, I wish I had time to talk to some parents. But this, this whole issue for my father was you do not quit. My father would rather deal with, he says, you know, failing is not as bad as quitting because at least you tried but when you quit you don't even know what you could have done and so for my father and his generation quitting is not an option and you may be wondering where I'm going and what that has to do with Jesus talking about he's thirsty because when you really dig up underneath what Jesus was doing when you understand what Jesus was talking about I thirst in a very real sense, Jesus was saying, I'm not going to quit. When we get to this point, Jesus is well into his sacrifice. He's now been on the cross for about six hours. He has done all of the things that he went to the cross to do. He stood up. He's already said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He has already pardoned the man on his left. He's already taken care of his mother and John. He has already done the stuff. Now he turns and says, I'm thirsty. When he says, I'm thirsty, now the early writers would have understood that, that part of why John includes this in his book is because John is trying to get his early writers to know that Jesus is, yes, the Son of God, yes, he is also God, but he is also, Jesus is human. This is why it is so important that John writes it, because John is the gospel writer that wanted us to know that he's also divine. As early as the church has existed, there's always been tension. Your grandson wasn't the first one to struggle with the Trinity and the concept that he is both son of God and God and fully human. So when John writes this, he's trying to help us to understand that he is the son of God, but he is also a human being that gets tired and feels like giving up. But when he says, I'm thirsty in this moment in the text, He's saying, I'm almost through and I'm running out of energy, but I still got some more to say. I'm here because I am thirsty, not just for water, but I am thirsty for souls. I am thirsty to get God's will done and I'm fainting here. I need you to give me something to help me make it because I got a few more things to do on this cross before I give up the ghost. I thirst, but I want everybody to understand I will not quit. And I guess what I'm trying to get somebody to understand in here this morning, that if God has given you something to do, if you know that the thing that is before you is from God in your life, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, you've got to learn how to not quit. A couple of things come up in the text and I'm going to get out of your way to help you not quit. The first thing is, if you're going to not quit, you've got to make sure that you've got purpose. You know, at, at the end of the day, you've got to make sure that whatever you do is more than just a whim in your life. Because I can give up on a whim in a minute. 
But like Jesus, Jesus is on the cross and as he is on the cross, you need to understand it's not the nails that keep him on the cross. He is there prophetically. There's something from his past and his history that is pushing him, but there's also something in his future that is pulling him. He has purpose on the cross. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 12 and 1 to us, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God touch your neighbor say baby shout is coming here the way that Jesus was able to endure all this was not because he enjoyed what he was going through. He had an eye on what was coming next. And he understood that if I just make it through this, there is a joy on the other side. I need some older people in here with some gray hair, no matter what color it is right now, that will help some of these young folk know. Some of your best blessings come through some of your worst times, but you got to hold on through the middle of it. And if you hold on here, there's a blessing on the other side side of through. Am I talking to anybody here? And I don't know about you, but for me, I can't do anything if I can't see uh, down the road on it. Let, let me see if I can make a plan. I was talking about uh, Reverend Leroy Miles this morning, my partner in crime and working out and all that. Now, unlike Leroy, Leroy can work out just to work out. Leroy, he thinks working out is a good idea. <laughs> just in general, it's just a good idea. That ain't where I am. I work out because I got a goal. Tell me I got to weigh something at October 27th or tell me we're going to go, you know, attack somebody on October 28th or tell me we're going to play against some young boys in basketball and I will work towards that date. But just to get up to work out because it's a good, no, that ain't me. I got to have a goal up there. I'm just telling you the truth. As long as I see something up there, then I can work out with the best of them. I'll put it in. I'll put the time in because I see something up front. That's called vision. You're looking, but you're not listening. In everything you do, you got to make sure you've got vision for it. There ought to be some teleological purpose behind what you got involved in. There are far too many of us who do things because somebody else is doing them or follow in other folks footsteps as opposed to hooking up with the purpose that God has in your life and then you begin to keep your eyes on the prize and if you keep your eyes on the prize then when it gets tough when it gets difficult you'll know that I know that God has something for me on the other side of this if I was a better preacher you'd be throwing something at me right now but that's all right we'll catch up later the reality is you've got to have purpose if you're not gonna quit well, let me see if I can dig deeper in here. Not only do you have to have purpose, but you've got to be willing to stay in the present. See if I can unpack this. It's, this is an interesting text because there are actually two wine tastings, if you will, for Jesus at the cross. The first wine tasting, if you will, uh, every person that was crucified would be given wine mixed with gall or myrrh on the front end of it. And what wine mixed with gall or myrrh, it was like a very potent wine with a drug in it. And it was given for the purpose of uh, sort of numbing the body so it would put you out of your, ministry, uh, put you out of your misery quicker. You'll read about that. The uh, Bible says that they offered it to him in Matthew 27 and they offered it to him in Mark 15, but Jesus didn't take it. Now, th this was like a, this was, uh, I guess the best way I could put it is, it wasn't just normal uh, beer. It wasn't just normal wine. It was wine that had been doctored up, kind of like malt liquor in our community. Uh, you know, you find, you find Old E or St. Ives up in our community that you can't get out in Montgomery County. Y'all gonna wait on me for a while. So, so they were trying to give him a 40 ounce of Old E on his way to the cross to get him real liquored up, but Jesus would not take that. But here on the cross, here on the cross when he says, I'm thirsty, they gave him something called Pascha. 
It was a drink that the Roman soldiers, it was a vinegar. Now, once wine is turned to vinegar, there's no alcohol content. So when they offer him the Pascha, it is something that they would drink out there and they would drink it because the soldiers had to stay out there till everybody was dead. And this was a very long experience. The first thing they offered him that he would not drink was something like a malt liquor. The second thing he asked for was something like a real nasty Gatorade. Now you're going to catch up. Touch your neighbor and say, it's going to blow your mind. On the front end, they tried to give him something that would alleviate the pain, something that would take him out of the moment, something that would cause him not to suffer so long. But he said, no, I can't avoid this. I got to go through it. So you're not going to let me get drunk through this and miss out on what I'm supposed to go through. But on the other end, when he was getting tired and when he was ready to give up and he knew he still had something else to do, he said, give me some of that Gatorade, something because I I still got a few more things I got to say and I don't want to miss a thing y'all looking at me like I'm crazy the stuff they gave him to try to get him out the moment he rejected but the stuff they gave him that would help him stay and finish the job he took it he said because I'm going to be in the moment I'm not going to miss one piece of this even if it hurts me I know that when I come out of it I come out as pure gold can I keep pushing it one of the problems that many of us face is that we will quit even though we don't leave. Some of us have quit and we still in it. Oh, y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Let me see if I can make this thing plain. I never will forget when I stopped playing football. I will tell you when I stopped playing football, it was in the middle of the game uh, against Shaw High School. In the 10th grade, let me tell you why, why I stopped playing football. I can tell you when I stopped. Now, I, play, I finished the game. My father wasn't going to let me quit the team. I already explained that to you. But I quit in here in the middle of the game. I'll tell you what happened. When I played football, I started out just like anybody else playing flag football. All of us were little boys, and we were all the same size. And I played quarterback, and I was good against boys all my same size. And then when I got to the seventh grade, I played quarterback and I played football and I was good with boys my same size. I was even the starting quarterback of Woodbury Junior High School, junior high school football, and I played football. I was the quarterback and I was good. And we got to Shaker Heights High School. That summer, everybody grew. <laughs> Fellas started getting bigger. And I weighed all of 100 pounds in the 10th grade I wrestled 103, and I will never forget. We were back on the kickoff, and my friend Bino, who is now the actual the head coach at Shaker Heights High School, went on to play football at Syracuse. But I will never forget. We were back on the kickoff. Bino caught the ball, and Bino ran. Bino got tackled, and Bino broke his leg. I saw his leg break. I saw it. It looked like Joe Feisman. Remember that? I saw the leg break. I was out there. Maybe if I'd been blocking, uh, maybe his leg wouldn't have got broken. I don't know. All I know is I was on the field. I saw his leg break. And when his leg went like that, something inside my head said, this is not the sport for you. On the wrestling mat, the other guy is your same size, and you are a very good wrestler. I was a very good wrestler. I was okay at football. For the rest of that game, I had left the game. Oh, I was still in the game, but there was nothing about me that said I was playing for real. I would hike the ball. Hike! I was throwing it to anybody. Get this ball away from me. Time can run out as fast. That's right. I was screaming when it came in. I quit while I was still on the field. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy, but that's what's wrong with some of your marriages. Y'all still in it, but you quit. That's what's wrong with some of, you're still in there. Ain't nobody left the house, but ain't no love there any longer. You're still in there. You still come to church, but you ain't lifting up your hands. You're still on the team, but you're not really pulling. There are a whole lot of folk who claim to still be there, but they quit a long time ago. 
the reality is Jesus said no I'm not going to allow I'm not going to allow you to get me drunk and there are some of us in here today that are missing out on life because life has gotten too hard for you so you'll choose alcohol or you'll choose your addiction or you'll choose something to get you out of there but the problem is it only gets you out for a little while and when you come back you now have compound interest on the problem you were trying to avoid if you'd have just stayed there then you could stay there and handle it because is there anybody that knows if you stay in it and call God to it instead of you running from it then God has a way of jumping in your situation so you've got to stay present but you need to stay present because you don't want to miss the scenes can I see if, let's see if I can make this plan you don't want to miss the scenes Thursday night, Thursday night, we were down, and I, I've been thinking about this with uh, Morgan. I went down Thursday night to Baltimore. Morgan has joined another church. That's what she's supposed to do. She's grown. But it dawned on me Thursday night as I watched her receive the right hand of fellowship at the New Psalmist Church. I'm not her pastor anymore. We're driving back, and I'm thinking, Erica doesn't live in our house anymore. And as much as I joke about it, the, the reality is a scene is gone. I started having flashbacks. I started thinking about when they were little girls. And then I start trying to remember some, some good times. And I start, I start thinking about stuff. And, and I began, I never thought I'd get this old and say, where did the time? Am I talking to anybody else in here? Where, where did the time go? They're, they're grown and you, and, you, and you kind of, don't tell nobody I said this, but you, you, you kind of miss them. As much as I talk about they out the house, you kind of miss the little girls that were used to be there and then you wish for a scene. You wish that you'd been more present. You wish that you could remember some things. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. You ought to take every day and smell every bit of every rose. You ought to take, don't take for granted when you got somebody in front of you saying that they love you make don't tell don't take for granted that you ought to say you love you back oh can I stay there for a little while that's why you can't wait till somebody dies and then want to dive in the casket on the day of the funeral because of the guilt that you're feeling for not being present while they were alive instead of waiting for them to die why don't you go and call them today and tell them let's spend some time together let me be present in the moment but can I keep pushing a little further there's another because the reality is the reality is you got to stay present even not only in the good times but you got to stay present in the bad times because if you stay present in the bad times then your shout will really make sense oh let me see if I can make it plain does anybody in here have a shout right now because you remember how bad it was you didn't run away for you remember what you had to cry you remember the heartaches you remember the late nights you remember the heaviness and you remember how God brought you through it that's why when you come into his presence you humble yourself lift up both your hands and you begin to pray how many of you thank God that last night you didn't have to go through the weeping that endures for a night because you've already been there bought the t-shirt designed the hat but you're here to tell about it somebody asked me how come I stand on furniture and how come I throw things you don't know what I've been through you don't know where God has brought me from and when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me I was there when I was losing my mind I was there when I felt like giving up but I held on and now I'm here to give God the craziest praise I could ever give him because he's been good uh, come on touch your neighbor say you got to stay present you got to stay present in it. Don't, don't leave out of the relationship. You got to stay present. Don't miss out on the good times. But don't run out on the bad times either. Next time you're going through a bad time, just say to yourself, this is just material for my testimony. That, that, that's right every now and then somebody getting on your nerves just look at them just say you just material for my testimony <laughs> yeah, right now I don't feel good but you're going to be in chapter 4 I promise you <laughs> because when this thing is over yeah, you got to come in if you're going to make it through you've got to have purpose 
If you're going to not quit, you've got to stay in the present. But then, but then if you're going to not quit, you have to make sure that you have a proper perspective. It's in the text. It's in the text. My, you know, it blows my mind how much my father's worldview was so much a part of that generation's worldview. They just believed in don't give up. Everything about the culture said don't give up, don't throw in the towel, don't throw it away. We were raised by people who, who fixed our clothes. You got holes in your jeans, you ain't throw them away. You fix them, put that little patch in there, you walk around looking like the tin man. Amen. And your mother bought jeans that were just a little too big when she bought them for you. And then you sort of let, you remember them, you, you have cuffs that just kept getting let out. And the bottom of your, the bottom of your, 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 your thing, little lines from how you've been growing. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Because you fixed stuff. And you stuck with it because you did not give up. But there's another thing. You got to have a perspective on where you are. Some of us give up just too soon. See if I can show you in the text. It's interesting reading this text because he's been on the cross now for six hours. And when you read John 19, 28, it begs you to go on to 29. Because 19, 28 says that they gave him the, they gave him the vinegar. And then 29 says, and when he had received the vinegar, he says, uh, then he says, it is finished. Now, but wait a minute, it is finished is the word for next week. And so that I'm struggling this week in, in the context of the sermon, because I'm saying now, this really goes with this sermon, but it's next week's word. It's so close, it is finished, is so close to I thirst that you almost need to do them at the same time. But they really are two different words, but, but they're so close. I mean, as soon as he says, I thirst, then it's time for it's finished. If I was a better preacher, you'd be throwing something at me. See, some of us don't realize how close I thirst is to it's finished. Some of us don't realize if you just hold on. I mean, you've been up there for six hours. This ain't the time to quit now. I mean, you've been going through it this long. This ain't the time to quit now. I mean, if you were going to quit, you should at least quit at the beginning. But now that you've been through all this, after all these tears, after all this trouble, after all this six hours, and I thirst is right next to it's finished. If I was a better preacher, I think I'd be doing a better job. But I'm stopped by to tell somebody that you're right on the cusp of a blessing. I know it doesn't feel like it, but you can't quit now. If God was going to give up on you, he could have gave up on you back in 1979. But after all that and you're still here, look at your neighbor and say, I can't quit now. I've come too far. He's been too good. He's brought me too far. When I look back over my life and when I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed because the Lord has brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Is there anybody in here that can say if it had not been for the Lord on your side, is there anybody in here that can say the Lord has brought me from a mighty long way I shall not give up Hebrews says that we are not of those who shrink back but we are of those who hold on to God's unchanging hand in the all right in the all right what I'm about to be done just grab your neighbor for me and say neighbor you've come too far you've cried too much you pray too much to give up now hold on help is on the way God will see you through in the all right have I got a witness say yes say yes say yes God has been good to me he's opened doors I could not see so I won't complain. Yes! I won't quit. 
I will not quit. I will not quit. Listen, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I know there's some folk in here, and I'm not playing with this right now, but if you came in here knowing you had quit on your mind, or whatever the situation was, but you know that God is saying, you got to hold on. You can't throw this one in the towel. If I'm talking to you, this is not an invitation to join the church. You can join the church at any point. But if you came in here with quit on the mind, I want you to join me at this altar. This is not a general call. This is for a very specific call. You came in here saying, I'm ready to throw this thing in. I want you to join me right now. We're praying for strength. We're praying for resolve, for commitment. We turning this thing around. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, we can't quit. We can't quit. We can't quit. I won't quit. I won't quit. Come on, while we're coming. Yeah, 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 come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, come on, we not, we not quitting today. When I look around and when I think things over all of my good days Outweigh all my my bad days. I I won't complain. Sometimes my clouds hang low. I can hardly see the road. Now I ask the question Lord why why so much pain but Jesus knows what's best for me <laughs> even though my will eyes they cannot see so I'll just say thank you Lord I, I won't complain for God has been good to me Yes, he's been good to me more than this world could ever be. He's been good, he's been real good, he's been good to me. turns my midnights into day so I'll just say thank you Lord even though I cry sometimes thank you Lord even though I bear my burdens in the heat of the day I, I won't complain. Uh. Mm. Ooh. 
oh God. God, some of us are at this altar. We are at the end of the knot in the rope. God, we're here with no answer. We're here with nothing but trust in you. God, some of us came in here saying, if you don't do it, it can't get done. If you don't answer it, it will not be answered. We have nothing. We know nothing. But God, we know we don't have to know as long as we know you. So God, we're here just trusting you. Empty trust. Lord, just believing you didn't bring me this far to leave me right here. You didn't bring me to this moment for me to throw in the towel, God. And just like you on the cross were willing to do what you had to do to make it through God we're standing at this altar saying if you do it we're going to be all right so God I'm not telling you how to fix it I'm not even here to ask you for anything just Lord uh, help me make it through Lord help me to get my mind together Lord help me to get my heart together Lord help me to get my praise back Lord even if you're gonna leave me in it for a little while longer let me get a sip from you God uh, that I can keep on uh, standing and holding up the banner God uh, but God, I know you brought me uh, from a mighty long way. Uh, and for that, I am grateful. Uh, so God, as I get ready to leave this altar, I'm leaving it with a renewed energy. Uh, I'm leaving it understanding uh, that you're standing right by me. Thank you for goodness and mercy. Lord, thank you for your power. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for another chance, God, uh, in the name of Jesus. And right now, God, I thank you for helping me to forgive who I need to forgive I thank you for giving me another chance God and I'm walking out of here knowing that I am the head and not the tail above and not beneath I thank you God for restoring my joy I thank you for restoring the peace I thank you that no weapon formed against me shall ultimately prosper and every lying tongue shall cease now move by your spirit and before I leave this altar to God. Don't only bless me. Bless the neighbor right next to me, God. And even if my blessing doesn't come tonight, I pray that you bless my neighbor. For even as you bless my neighbor, it's a reminder to me that you're in the neighborhood. Move and ride on in the name of Jesus. I want to say thank you. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus, I count it done. I count it done. I call it done. I call it done. In the name of Jesus, now may the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, Rest, rule, and abide with each of us until we meet again. We ask it in the matchless, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus the Christ. And for his sake we do pray. Let every heart say amen. 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 And amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, it's done God, hallelujah. And, and after Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, it is finished, bowed his head and gave up the ghost. One thing that really bothers me about Holy Week, particularly about Good Friday, is that we spend a lot of imaginative energy trying to reclaim and reimagine Calvary as we turn a blind eye to the state-sponsored violence that happens all around us. Uh, what I love about Good Friday is that it is a time where people who seemingly don't have power get to put power in its place. And here Jesus, our teacher, our savior, 
Jesus on the cross, not dying an ordinary death, but Jesus being executed by the hands of the empire. And this was a time for the empire to show all the Jews that you don't have power and you ought to stay in your place. And I have discovered that power only bothers itself with people who are perceived to be powerless when people who are powerless actually threaten power. And, and this is what I love about Jesus because Jesus, even on the cross, Jesus, even being swallowed up by death, is a threat to power. And we have found out in this country that what they do, the threats is, they warehouse threats in prisons, they warehouse threats in unfailing schools they warehouse threats in places where they do not is there anybody in here today that can say America knows how to handle threats they put threats in ghettos they put threats in low performing neighborhoods they put threats in places where the zip codes determine the funding for education but I'm so glad that what they do to me does not tell me who I am but it shows me that they're afraid of me and is there anybody in here today that can say that's who I am. They could talk about me. They could malign me. They could racially profile me. They can follow me in their cars. But at the end of the day, the only reason why they're after me is because I'm powerful. And I wish there were at least 10 powerful people in here today that can say, I know my worth. I know I'm powerful because power better get out the way when I show up. And this is Jesus. Jesus on the underside of power. Jesus being humiliated by the empire because that is what crucifixion was. It was a time to humiliate people who got out of place. It, it was a time to humiliate people who didn't follow the orders. It, 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 this is similar to shooting an unarmed boy and leaving him in the street for four hours. This, this, this is like uh, on, on camera choking out a person trying to make a living because of nonsensical tax codes in this country. This is an act of humiliation. And for those of you all who think that you're beyond the reach of a evil empire like America, they will also lynch your dreams and they will assassinate your aspirations. They will terminate your self-confidence. You better be careful about how you bow to pseudo power. But here's Jesus. Jesus, he, I, I, I love him because Jesus, he, he pursues possibilities in the midst of death. I love the way our brother said it, that he gropes for life in the midst of death. And he does it because the Bible says in order to fulfill the scripture. That, 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 that in order for scripture to be fulfilled, he had to imbibe the bitterness of the vinegar, the, the bitterness of the wine. And this is for all of us who believe that God is calling us and, and pulling us into assignment and pulling us into work, that you better be also clear that your assignment may have pain connected to it. Because just because God calls you does not mean it's going to be safe, does not mean it's going to be easy, does not mean it's going to be neat. And so some of us need to turn off the television and stop imbibing some of this cotton candy theology that tells us if we have enough faith we'll have enough money if you buy me a jet then you'll have some favor but you need to know he he takes the wine he he he, he imbibes the bitter substance in order to fulfill the scriptures and someone should know that sometimes your wounds become the womb for your wisdom I may need to say that again because somebody may want to tweet that. That your wounds can become the womb of your wisdom because there's some things you learn on crosses that you never learn on the mountaintop. There's some lessons you learn about yourself in pain that you will never learn in pleasure. I love this because Nietzsche says, Nietzsche says, if you know the why of your life, then you can handle the how of your life. And this is Jesus drinking the bitter wine but he's also in darkness uh, my grandmother's generation used to say the sun refused to shine 
It's dark. J Jesus is, is bruised. He, he, he's beaten. He's battered. He's bleeding. He's taking in bitterness, but he's also staring in darkness. And I know that some of us uh, suffer from nyctophobia. That, that means you're afraid of the dark. And some of us thought we outgrew uh, the darkness. Some of us think we outgrew the fear of darkness, but that's not a child's reality. But there are some of us who do not know how to handle the darkness that life presents us but you know what I've discovered about the darkness I, I got this from Zora Neale Hurston that sometimes you have to stare in the darkness and when you stare in the darkness your eyes are really watching God is there anybody in here today that can say I have found myself in darkness I have found myself in moments where I could not see God where I could not see my way but I went through the Bible and I discovered that God does some of his best work in the dark you do remember when God created the world he created the world out of darkness so maybe your dark situation does not mean God is absent but that means God is getting ready to kick in his artistic mode and start creating some new things in your life be careful child of God of being afraid of the dark because God does great things in the that's what I'm trying to say some of us have have nip niptophobic theology because we're too busy trying to chase the light and we miss that God can live in darkness some of us have niptophobic theology that whenever we find ourselves in darkness we start reaching for night lights you know what I mean when we reach for night lights when we seek validation from people who have never been where we've been that's a night light when you start rehearsing your arrogance as a facade for your low aim that's a night light when you start depending on people who drain you instead of build you up that's a night light when you come to worship and you want to get a feel-good experience and go out of the church and not serve anybody that's a night light but I'm so glad I don't need a night light because God told me I am the light in dark places is there anybody in here today that says life will be tough but I can handle the darkness because God made me in the dark in order to fulfill the scriptures, I'm taking too long, in order to fulfill the scriptures, I have learned that God didn't simply give me the Bible, but God also writes words on my heart. The, 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 in, in the Greek, I know Jesus didn't speak Greek, but in the Greek, it says in order to fulfill scripture, in order to fulfill that which has been inscribed, that's what it really means, the inscription, because God, yes, gives you the Bible, but God also writes words on your heart, which means that you don't have to always celebrate Moses. Sometimes you need to celebrate your own courage. You don't simply need to celebrate Sarah and Rachel and, Rachel and Rebecca, but sometimes you have to celebrate what God is doing through you. If God God wanted you to sit around and celebrate people in the Bible. Why would he have called you to do what he wants you to do in the first place? God will write a word on your heart that you have to learn how to externalize in your life. God will write a word on your heart that you have to learn how to live with your body. And you know why I have to say this, Pastor? Because I don't like church folk either. Because church folk can quote the Bible, but they can't live the Bible. Church folk know all 66 books, but they don't know how to be who God is calling them to be. God will write the words on your heart. He took the wine in order to fulfill scripture, writing the words on his heart. I remember there's this Hasidic story. Probably Jesus knew this growing up. But, they, but a, a rabbi used to always say, well, uh, God will write the words on your heart. Read the scriptures in order to write the words on your heart. And some young precocious kid came up to the rabbi and said, why do you tell us that, that we write the scriptures on our hearts instead of writing them in our hearts? And the, and the rabbi said, well, the only reason why I say write it on your heart and not in your heart is because only God can write scriptures in your heart. And so you have to learn to write them on your heart because when your heart breaks, the word falls in and I have a feeling that there's some heartbroken people in here today who found out when their heart was broken greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world when your heart was broken weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning when your heart was broken God will tell you he's with you uh, I gotta push on I gotta push on uh, in order to fulfill the scriptures he 
he took on the wine. Uh, he, 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 had, he pursued possibilities, but he also had a paradox of perception because he says, it is finished. And I know this is cheap, this is easy, but he did not say, I am finished, but he said, it is finished. He did not say, I am over, but he says, it is over. I love him because they thought that they had checkmate on him, but he says, I still have stuff up my sleeves. They thought that it was done but he says I've been here too long and there's too much God in me for the empire to think that they can control me I wish there were some free people in here today because if you're free you better be careful because there's a cross somewhere for you because people with power don't know how to handle free people because free people don't back down are there any free people in here today? Somebody say I'm powerful. Somebody say I'm adaptable. Somebody say I'm unshakable because I'm free. Jesus says, Jesus says, Jesus says, Jesus says, you don't control my narrative. I, I love this. Before he died, he says, no one takes my life, but I lay down my life. That, that Jesus says, you may think you're in control, but you're not really in control. And I have a funny feeling that some of you all need to go to work on Monday. Some of you all need to go home tonight and let some people know you think you can control me, but you don't really control me because nobody takes my life, but I lay my life down I have to go I have to go there's a little more I want to say right there but I gotta go you 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 have to have a paradox the, the paradox of your perception because I know they think they can write your story but sometimes you have to take the pen back and show them that they don't write with ink but they write with pencil and so everybody who thought they wrote my story you ain't seen the great eraser in my life because I'm still here okay all right. Uh, pursue possibilities. He pursued possibilities. He had a paradoxical perception, but he also had a posture of persistence. A posture of persistence. Because it says, he gave up the ghost, bowed his head. Now, you have to understand the situating of the cross. That the, the, the uh, uh, default posture was a bowed head. But Jesus had to spend three hours refusing to bow his head too soon. And so it took strength and energy in order for Jesus to keep his head up. The only reason you were able to hear him say, Father, forgive me. Mother, behold thy son. Uh, 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 my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because he did not bow his head too soon. And that is the tragedy of so many of us who God has called. We don't know how to follow through on anything. That the moment when it gets too tough, we want to throw in the tower. And there's some people in here today who are singing the coulda, woulda, shouldas. If I only stuck it out, maybe I have a degree right now. If I only kept on going, maybe I feel better about myself right now. But God says, as long as you have breath in your body, there's still time for you to reclaim what you think you lost. You better keep your head up through it all. Jesus did not bow until it was over. Is there anybody in here today that can say, all God wants me to do is be faithful church people want me to be perfect but God says be faithful church people think they can hold me on their strings but God says just be faithful and is there anybody in here today that can say I may not have a lot of money but I'm still faithful I may not have a lot that people think's going on but I'm still faithful because God wants me to be faithful there it is Jesus he holds on because Jesus refuses to live a half-baked life. Je Jesus decides not to be a mediocre, uh, a monument of mediocrity. Je Jesus decides that I'm not going to be half-baked. Because you do know that we live in a country that celebrates unfinished things. You all know Mount Rushmore with all those heads of the presidents. That was supposed to be full bodies of presidents. But they quit the project too soon. And we go around celebrating something that is half-finished. But I'm glad today that every child of God says, I'm going to be like Jesus. 
Jesus. I'm just going to finish it. I'm just going to keep going. I'm not going to allow the missiles to cause me to turn around because God is calling me to finish. Anybody glad Jesus didn't give up too soon? Anybody glad Jesus didn't bow his head too soon? He transformed water into wine, but that didn't make him bow too soon. He gave his best sermon to a Pharisee that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but he didn't bow his head too soon he told a woman at a well that I know you've been using your body as currency for validation but there's more to life than where you've been he gave a lad's lunch to a multitude of people but he didn't bow his head too soon he kept on going because he said I know I've done great things but there are greater things for me to do and is there anybody in here today that can say I can't give up now I can't turn in now because I've done some good things in my life but I can't bow until I've done everything God has told me to do is there anybody in here today that can say I'm learning to trust in God that I'm learning to trust in him because my God is able anybody here know he's able my God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think according to the power at work in me is there anybody here that can say I'm too powerful to give up now there's too much God in my veins too much God in my blood too much God in my body to give up now because weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning I'm learning to trust in God because he's able to pick me up turn me around place my feet on solid ground is there anybody here that say some trust in horses some trust in chariots but I'll trust in the name of the Lord because in his name there's power in his name there's deliverance in his name there's joy say yes say yes won't he make a way for you? Won't he open doors for you? Won't he provide for you? Say yes! Yes! Ah! Say yes! Say yes! Say yes! It's finished! I'm not finished! It's over! But I'm still here! Yes! sealed in the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter, the 46th verse, declares that God then says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. I want to preach for a little while tonight using as a subject, the campaign is suspended. campaign is suspended. For eight years, Francois, the Republican Party has been strategizing on how to undermine the presidency of Barack Obama. Attempts at stalemating universal health care was met with no success. Blocking reentry to Cuba was a colossal failure. Stifling the economy and thwarting job creation went bust. So they assembled a motley crew of candidates to lambast his legacy. Larger than any presidential pool in history haphazards kept jumping in. 
The blueprint of the enemy is that after attempting to assassinate your ideas, he will raise up individuals who will attempt to assault your identity. At the final count, 17 people submitted themselves to fight the legacy of one man. You only know how powerful you are based off of how many people don't like you. The presumed favorite at the outstart was Jeb Bush, the former governor of Florida, who had both a father and brother who formerly occupied the White House. He had the seeming pedigree and blessing of the party. And Rudy, it's reminiscent of when Samuel went to Jesse's house to anoint a successor to Saul. He thought it would surely be the oldest son, simply by what he looked like. But God said, he's not the one. And after spending $130 million dragging his mother out of retirement, bringing his brother out of obscurity, with tear-stained cheeks, he had to tell his small retinue of followers, I regret to tell you, I suspend the campaign. Reaching into the same region was 44-year-old Marco Rubio, an excellent public speaker, a rising senator, son of Cuban immigrants yet stern against immigration. Accusing the sitting commander-in-chief of being failing to lead. His youthful presence and conservative views were a short mass appeal. But he failed to deliver his home state. And any number of these preachers will tell you it would be hard to win the world when you lose your home. And so after he lost his home, he got up and made the announcement. I suspend my campaign. Birthed out of Baltimore's Johns Hopkins University. 63 year old neurosurgeon Ben Carson. The ultra conservative neurosurgeon who successfully separated conjoined twins. Found his way to New York times for his book Gifted Hands only to reveal he had a contaminated heart. As a doctor taking the oath he had the nerve to say that health care was a privilege and not a right and further went down the plank and declared that universal health care was worse than slavery. The Bible admonished us long before his announcement that you should have clean hands and a pure heart. And that's why in this season of your life, you can't just let anybody lay hands on you. He was the selected melanin for the season. even after it is that he had the affirmation of people who really did not appreciate his intellect but prostituted his naivety he had to stand up and make the announcement I suspend my campaign standing on the evangelical values coming from the great state of Texas Ted Cruz, who said that he was the moral candidate, 
somehow or another can't be found near a microphone today. But in a few short days, I expect an announcement. A suspended campaign simply means they are no longer vying for the position they were in original hopes of obtaining. They thought they had a chance, but it becomes clear that there's no path towards victory. They're not dropping out, they're just fading away. For the last three years, the enemy has been mounting a campaign trying to get victory over your body. For the last three years, he has been on the campaign trail going after your sanity. Over the last three years, he's been campaigning hard to reduce the value of your humanity. For the last three years, he's been trying to get boosters and sponsors to help him pay for the campaign to stop your destiny. But on this Good Friday night, unlike Dr. Adolph, I don't invite you to a fight. I invite you to a press conference. Because Satan wants to, in all humility, stand at the bottom of Golgotha's Hill and make the announcement now that he sees Jesus breathing his last breath. But I hate to inform you that the campaign has just been suspended. I can tell that uh, you really don't understand the value, the weight, and the gravity of what that means. But for Satan to say that he has suspended his campaign means he knows there's no way he can win. He's counted up all of his delegates. He sees who's on his side, but he sees that there is something on your destiny that is stronger than his defense. And the campaign just ended. It might hit you when you roll over tonight that the pain that you've been feeling in your body that was supposed to immobilize you and keep you strapped in somehow has fled you while you were sleeping. Because everything that was supposed to render you in hospice somehow has seeped out of your pores because the campaign just ended. You don't even know why you've been feeling heavy, stressed, worried, and overwhelmed with anxiety. How about you woke up not feeling a care in the world because the attack against your mind has just come to an end. I'm sorry, I might as well preach to somebody two rows behind you because uh, they don't even understand what I'm saying. What I'm trying to tell you, please forgive me. I'm sorry for trying to preach to you. I'm talking to somebody two rows behind you. The attack the enemy launched against your child. Uh, it, it just came to an end. Hallelujah. Because he realizes whatever he thought he was going to do to them. It is not going to work. Why? Because there's a hedge fence of protection around your child's life. There's some of y'all that don't know when to shout, can I help you real quick? You getting ready to be healed right now because there's been an assault against your body that everything that was out of order is getting ready to line up with his will. God says, if you give me glory, you don't even know. I'm not going to give you a car. I'm going to give you the blessing of Hezekiah. I'm going to add 15 years to your life. Because the enemy meant it for evil, but I'm getting ready to work it out for your good. You, you sitting beside somebody, you trying to figure out why they not worshiping. They not stuck up. They just thinking about how they should have gone crazy. With everything that's been going on in their mind, but something just reminded them he will keep me in perfect peace if I keep my mind stayed on him. There ought to be three of y'all just running through the building. Why? Because the campaign.
campaign against your finances just ended hallelujah you ain't gonna bounce another check whatever bills come to your house God said I already gave you the resources for cause you forgot I am Jehovah Chira hallelujah would you be seated right where you are huh? my time is almost up thank you I need you to look at your neighbor and tell him you didn't hear what the pastor is preaching about hallelujah that title was too long so let me just ah uh, yes hallelujah that's too long that's that's too long let me try to shorten it because my time is almost up let me shorten the title of it uh, this sermon is now just called two words it's over hallelujah I, I, I don't know who that's for that for some of y'all that don't mean nothing because you ain't been going through nothing but for five of you that know the devil just got defeated would you just shout out loud it's over I know you don't sat through six sermons and, and your mind can't take much more but would you just look at whoever's sitting around you and tell them I don't know how you sit in there quiet but if the last three years of your life was anything like my last three years I'll tear this church up but I came to tell the devil you should have killed me in September. But because I'm still here, it's over. Hallelujah. Be, be seated, please. I'm coming around the mountain. Here I come. Be seated, please. I'm begging you. I just need 50 of you to echo it in the chamber here. No matter what I tell you tonight, I just need 50 of my designated praisers to just keep shouting out loud, it's over. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm waiting to find where my 50 are. You ain't got to talk to your neighbor. I need you to say it to yourself. It's over. The night cry. The days that I was aware. When I was afraid when the phone would ring. Just 50 of y'all shout it's over. It don't matter what the doctor says. What, what the lawyer says. What the judge says. 50 of y'all just shout it's over. Be seated, please. Hallelujah. I only got two more times to tell you that. Hallelujah. Please be seated. I'm waiting on my 50. Y'all supposed to be preaching with me. I said, no matter what happens, just keep saying it. It's over. Hallelujah. Where are my 50? Hallelujah. I need 50 co pastors right through here. Just keep shouting. It don't matter what I say. It don't matter if Bloomer comes up. If we go off the air, just keep shouting it. It's over. Even when folk think you going crazy. I don't need you to say it to your neighbor. Say it like you sitting in the car. It's over. I got to be worried about this. It's over. Be seated. Hallelujah. Except for my 50. Hallelujah. Be seated except for the 50. Hallelujah. God help me to preach it right. Just 50 of y'all I still can't hear you. It's over. I need you to be the pastor of your row. Tell all of them stuck up say. It's over. You've been in this place long enough. And the going's been kind of tough. But the struggle God, I can't hear nobody. Be seated, please. We got to get out. Where are my 50? Hallelujah. I'm waiting on my 50 to help me. Would you grab that neighbor's hand and tell him, neighbor, the crying is over. God, that ain't the right neighbor. I said, pull on that neighbor. Tell him the crying is over. You ain't got to ask nobody for nothing. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. It's over. Where am I 50? Lay hands on yourself. I ain't got to be stressed out and depressed. It's over. I can't hear nobody. Don't talk to your neighbor. Don't talk to yourself. Talk to every devil in hell. You thought you had me. Seated. Huh. And this is the last time I'll ask you to do it. Hallelujah. Be seated. 
except for my 50. Just keep saying it. It's, I can't find my 50. Maybe I can find 500 of you. I can't hear it in the atmosphere. I need you to keep shouting it out loud. I can't hear nobody. No more drama in your house. Hi, I can't hear nobody. No more attitude problems out of your child. No more pain in your body. Somebody just shout out loud. It's over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank I hear 10 of them. I'm waiting on the other 40. Hallelujah. I can't hear nobody. Hallelujah. I'm waiting on just 50 of y'all to just keep shouting it out loud. Hallelujah. I can't hear you. Oh God, something is getting ready to break in just 30 seconds. I need you to just charge the atmosphere. It's over. God, I can't hear nobody. Hi, yeah, yeah. It's over. It's getting ready to happen. Heaven is getting ready to open up. But I need to hear 30 of you in the room. It's over. God, I can't feel you. I need you to grab that neighbor's hand. Hallelujah. And say, neighbor, you just survived the worst season of your life. Whatever you went through in the last three years is setting you up for the next three years. It's over. I need you to pull on that neighbor. If you were going to die, it would have happened a long time ago. It's over. If you were going to lose your mind, it would have happened a long time ago. It's over. Seated. Be seated. Hallelujah. Bertram. Uh, Bertram Jesus was on the campaign trail. I can't hear nobody, huh? Forget about your neighbor. Would you just have a private praise moment? I'm trying to preach this thing, but I feel something in this room. Would you just shout out loud? It's over, yes. It's over, yes. It's over. Can I tell you, he's getting ready to turn it. If you believe it, turn right where you are. It's over, it's over. It's over, it's over. It's over, it's over. It's over, it's over. See, um, Jesus enters Jesus enters the race on the campaign trail called uh, Villa Della Rosa. And when he mounts the campaign, his, um, his announcement speech was, um, Father, forgive him. God help me. I'm, hallelujah, Jesus. I can't find my 50, y'all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Craig, in the midterms, he, he said, I thirst. Where are my 50? Yes. Hallelujah. But now we at the general election. Hallelujah. And the text tells us he breathes his last breath. Hallelujah. And Satan and all of his imps didn't recognize the Morse code. Hallelujah. They, they thought, Bertram, that was the end. Hallelujah. But he was only speaking at this moment to Pentecostals. He breathed his last breath. What do you mean by that? 
because right now he's remembered David saying let everything that has breath praise the Lord I can tell why y'all ain't shouting good you ain't shouting good because you shouting like it ain't your last time but I wonder how would you praise him if this was your last night to give him glory how would you open up your mouth if you knew tomorrow wasn't promised how, how would you shout knowing you were supposed to die He now comes in his last word. Hallelujah. I hear 39 of you. I'm waiting on another 12 to catch up. Hallelujah. He, hallelujah. This, this side is really feeling that thing. I can't wait for y'all to get anointed. Huh? Hallelujah. If you on this side and you just got confirmation that it's over, I dare you to just shout in your living room. Huh? I dare you to holler right where you are. It's over. He's breathing his last breath. The Jerusalem Times reporter is there. A correspondent from the Rome Street Journal is on the scene. And he says, into thy hand. I commend my spirit. He sang, watch this, the campaign. God help me. It's over. Sean, we gotta go. My time is almost up, but I, uh, God, now Calvin Taylor, the considered dean of black preaching, said that no preaching is complete without a practicum. I need you right where you are, Sean. Let's go home. I am. Um, I need right where you are. I need somebody's hand in your hand. Just um, hallelujah. 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 I need somebody's hand in your hand. Hallelujah. He said, whatever you've been going after, whatever you've been trying to accomplish, whatever you've been trying to obtain, hallelujah, yes, is now out of your hands. I can't hear nobody. You, you ain't in competition with nobody. What I got for you is already yours. I can't hear nobody. You don't need a second interview. As soon as they meet you, it's already done. I can't hear nobody. I need somebody's hand in your hand. God told me to tell you right now, I've got your destiny in my hands. I've got your family in my hands. I've, I've got your future in my hands. I, all I need you to do is stop running. I need you to just act like it's already yours. I don't know where my worshipers are. I can't hear nobody. But God said, if you give me glory, whatever you've been going after is getting ready to come for you. Hallelujah. This will only mean something for those of y'all that been dreaming about something. Though, those of you that got a passion, though, if you got a goal you want to meet, God said, if you give me glory, let me put it in my hands. Hallelujah.
hallelujah that's getting ready to be a sound in Zion that's going to transport us beyond this place even for those of you who are watching online God said I need you to give me glory watch this for goals did you hear what I just said? I said, give him glory for goals. Everything you want to accomplish is getting ready to happen in the next three years. Hallelujah. I dare you to pull on that neighbor. Hallelujah. The business is already yours. The house is already yours. The assignment is already yours. The nonprofit is already yours. God said, if you give me glory, I'm getting ready to drop it in your hand. But I need a shout in here from those that believe my campaign in days are over. Softly, Sean, almost in a careless whisper. Hallelujah. He's, he's saying, Bloomer, I'm not quitting. I'm just going to stop trying. I'm not quitting. I'm just going to stop trying. I'm waiting for you to get it. I'm, I'm not quitting. But if God want me to have this, he going to have to do this thing. God, I can't hear nobody. Some, some of y'all haven't become weary and well doing. But those of you, God promised you something. And you ain't there yet. And everything around you don't look like what you've been going after. God said, I need one last cry. And if you cry out loud, everything that's been fighting your destiny is getting ready to be killed. Eh? Everything. I can't hear nobody. that hand right where you are loose that hand because you connected to somebody who don't know how bad you've been struggling they don't know the last three years of your life but those of you who know this is my last shot if it's gonna happen for me it's gonna happen for me now I don't know how it's gonna happen but that ain't my business but I trust God for it if I got 50 real worshipers in the room doing it for camera you ain't doing it to be seen but you need God to take it out of your hands and to put it into his hand would you lift up that voice would you cry out loud like it's in his hands I, I can't hear no worshipers I need you to shout like it's in his hand I can't hear you Sean, put your foot on the brake. Let me just hear the sound of worshipers. Hamasha. She can have a shot. Oh. God, I feel him in this room. Oh. Hallelujah. Something is getting ready to break can't hear nobody he said if you yell again there's a scholarship with your child's name on it he said if you yell again the promotion is already yours if you scream again I'm moving your supervisor to another department if you holler out loud your family is about to be reconciled if you scream your relative is about to be healed if you praise him every habit is about to be broken you gotta cry from your belly like it's out of your hand but I put it all 